Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, yeah, it's good to be here today. I'm going to talk to you about water quality, and it's probably uh, one of the most least um, uh, uh, aspects that we pay attention to um, when spraying herbicides and also other pesticides. So I'll give you a bit of background about water quality and what's important with the spray water that you use for application. And then uh, we'll talk a bit about other pesticides, but mostly on, on herbicides and why water quality is important. And then just a bit on adjuvants and the role that adjuvants play uh, with, in weed control. Uh, often we think that adjuvants are just snake oils that are added um, to, to increase the turnover of the guy that sells the product to you, but I'll show you today that adjuvants uh, play a huge role in herbicide efficacy. So what we'll talk about today, firstly, is salts in water, the opgelost sauter wat in enige water voorkom. Then we'll talk about pH, and why pH of spray water is important. I'll give you some examples of where pH or where salts in water play a role and could decrease the e efficacy of products. And then I'm just going to show one slide right at the end to show what happens when you choose the wrong adjuvant. Um, because often we find that uh, producers uh, want to use one product or maybe two pr adjuvants. They don't want to use a whole range of adjuvants. Um, and they use the wrong product to, to try and rectify a situation. And then we get uh, a problem. I often get the question, what is a good quality water? What is the best quality water that I can use to apply my pesticides? And my answer to that is, there's no good quality water. Um, each specific water quality, spray water quality, has its challenges, whether it's high in salts, low in salts, high pH, low pH. We use water because it's easily available and we can mix the pesticides with the water. But all water qualities have their challenges. So what's the challenges with different types of water? High dissolved salts in water, therefore hard waters, brackish waters, we get poor herbicide efficacy, especially certain herbicides like glyphosate and certain others. I'll mention some of them a bit later. Uh, the efficacy is decreased um, if there are high salts in water. Low dissolved salts in water. We often think that water that doesn't have any salts or dissolved salts in it, or sachter water, we think that those are very good waters, but they're not always good waters. We find in very soft water that we get a lot of foaming from specific pesticides, uh, foam more in, in soft water, and nine out of the ten problems that we have with incompatibility of products, flocculation in the spray tank or separation or blocked nozzles, that type of thing, nine out of the ten problems that we have are normally in areas where the water is soft. Um, and that's normally the problem that happens in soft water or low salt content water. High pH water, um, especially important to insecticides, and that's why we use buffers and acidifiers with insecticide applications, because it increases their efficacy in high pH water. But I'll show you some slides where um, a low pH is also detrimental to other products, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So let's start with the salts in water. And why salts, dissolved salts in water or hard or brackish waters are important. Now those are the salts that are dissolved in any quality water. If you look at the, the drinking water that you have in front of you, um, you'll probably have in those waters there will be a certain amount of calcium, a certain amount of magnesium, a certain amount of sodium, potassium, and that HCO3 at the bottom there is bicarbonate. So water always contains uh, a more, more or less uh, of those salts. Um, and EC is the electrical conductivity. Um, if you have an EC meter, for instance, that just indicates, gives a, a broad indication of the amount of dissolved salts uh, in that water. 
So let's look at a practical example. This is a true uh, water analysis um, that was done in the eastern part of South Africa, actually northern KwaZulu-Natal, but I'm sure you'll have uh, those type of waters in your area as well. Um, calcium, 243 parts per million. Magnesium, 70 parts per million. And sodium, 21 parts per million. Uh, with a total at the top there of 1,200 parts per million. That doesn't make any sense if you see those numbers. Let's look at that more practically. If we use or apply a water volume of 200 liters of water per hectare, what you actually have there is 70 grams of dissolved cations in that water that can react with your herbicide. So for instance, if you're applying a herbicide at a very low rate, 30, 40 grams for sulfonyl ureas, for instance, um, then you've got 60 grams of dissolved salts in that water that can react with um, a, a low amount of, of herbicide. And therefore, it's important to note that uh, even though the numbers might not look big, but a small amount of salts in water that are dissolved in water can have a huge effect on herbicide efficacy. And I've just got some numbers at the bottom there, that big number at the bottom. Um, that's basically the amount of calcium cations dissolved in that water, 200 liters of water per hectare that can react with your herbicide. So if you're applying glyphosate in that type of water, those are the numbers you're looking at, and um, that is why salts in water are so important. We'll get to that later, but let's just do the pH thing quickly. Not so important for herbicides, more for insecticides, but I'm going to show you in any way. There we have the pH scale, um, and you guys all know that the pH scale works from a pH of 1, which is very acid, Sulfuric acid will be there. Yeah, 14 is very alkaline. Uh, products like uh, JIC or uh, ammonia, those type of products will be in this vicinity. Now, all the waters that we have in South Africa, or most of them, the pH ranges between 6.5 and 9. That's at 95% of the water qualities in South Africa. There are some that are a bit outside of that range, but most of them are there. Um, that is a neutral pH around about 7, but all the, the water pHs are around about there. Now, if you use a buffer, for instance, and you add it to water, and it decreases the water pH by just one pH point, a pH from 9, say the water was a pH of 9, and you reduce it to a pH of 8, what that actually means is that you are increasing the acidity of the water tenfold. That's actually what it means. The pH scale is a very um, confusing scale. It's actually a log logarithmic scale. So with each pH point that you lower the pH with a buffer, you're actually increasing the acidity by tenfold. So if you decrease the acidity or the pH of water from 9 to a pH of 6, what you're actually doing you is increasing the acidity of that water a thousandfold. So therefore, if you've got a product that is broken down in water um, and you reduce the pH of that water only by one pH point, actually what you're doing, you're increasing the lifespan of that product tenfold in water or a pH of three points, a uh, pH reduction of three points, a thousandfold in water. So let me try and explain it like this. Um, insecticides, for instance, and certain herbicides, but it's mostly the insecticides, have what we call a half-life. A half-life of water is the amount of time that it takes for 50% of the product to break down. So, for instance, if you're applying a, a product, for instance, that uh, says on the label, use a buffer with this product, and you do not use a buffer with the product, and uh, you apply that product at a high pH, from when you add that product to the, to the spray tank until the droplet is dried on the leaf surface, that product breaks down. It degrades slowly. And when you apply your uh, insecticide, for instance, you're actually applying a lower rate than what you wanted to apply. So if we say a product, just to explain it uh, more clearly, if we say a product has a half-life of one hour, what it actually means, if you mix it in water and you do nothing about the pH, 
uh, and it stays at a high pH, after one hour, 50% of that product is broken down. After two hours, 50% of the 50% that remained is also broken down. So you're sitting with 25% of that product left over. Then theoretically speaking, after six hours, you've got about six, after, uh, yes, after four hours, you've got about 6% of that product remaining in the spray tank. Now that is a very extreme example. Very few of the products that you apply are that sensitive to water quality. That was just to explain the process to you. But that's why it's so important that if products are registered with buffers, that you will use the buffer with those products because it could be because the product is broken down in a high uh, pH water. But then we have something else we're fighting against in water quality. It's not just the pH of water, but it's the buffering capacity of water. You get, for instance, I've just got an example of two water qualities uh, in South Africa. Um, what I've got here is the pH scale on this side, so I'm just going to show you what happens when you um, use products um, to decrease the pH of water. Buffering capacity or the amount of bicarbonate in the water, or also known as alkalinity, is the um, uh, certain waters have, have a way of uh, just keeping the pH high. So that means you think you're adding a buffer product, for instance, to lower the pH of the water, but it's not going down as low as what you think it's going to go. So we use, uh, for instance, a certain rate of buffer in water quality number one, and we decrease the pH, goes down to the desired pH range. Normally, if we're using buffers, we want the pH to go down to a pH of 4 to 6. With certain other waters that have a high uh, buffering capacity or a high bicarbonate content, this type of thing happens. You think you're decreasing the pH to the correct level, but actually what's happening is you're not reducing the pH enough. So therefore, it's important to know what the water quality is. Know what the water quality on your farm is. If you do not know what type of uh, water quality you are using, then at least do a water analysis every three to four years. Cost you four or five hundred rand maybe, but it's the best investment that you can make in effective uh, pest control and effective weed control. So therefore you must know, because if you didn't know what was going on in that second water quality that I showed you, you will not be bringing the pH down enough uh, with buffer products. Good, we're going to go to some examples now. We've spoken about pH and we've spoken about uh, salts in water. Now we're going to uh, show you, I'm going to show you some examples of what happens uh, when you're applying a herbicide, for instance, glyphosate, as an example. Um, in a, in a, uh, uh, high, uh, a water with high dissolved salts, or a hard water, or a brackish water. There at the bottom, we've just got, I've got a representation of the leaf surface. What happens if you apply glyphosate um, in water that contains high calcium, for, for instance, or magnesium? You spray the droplet leaf, uh, uh, is on the leaf surface, spreads out on the leaf surface, and what you're sitting with then is glyphosate, and you're sitting with salts that were in that water, the droplet is busy drying on the leaf surface. If you did nothing about that water quality, what's going to happen is that calcium is going to bind to your glyphosate during that droplet drying process, and you're going to get a product that is absorbed very, very poorly. If you, uh, normally you can just uh, see it under a magnifying glass, but if you look at glyphosate droplets that have been applied with a hard water or high calcium water, for instance, or a high magnesium water, those droplets become very syrupy, they become um, sort of sticky, and they cannot be absorbed into the leaf surface. So what do we do about it? Um, well, before we get to what do we do about it, let's just show you uh, examples of what happens when you do nothing about water quality or about salts in water. I've got three pots there. They all receive the same rate of glyphosate. I don't know exactly what the rate was. It, uh, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. 
Um, the fact is all three of those pots had the same rate of glyphosate. The pot on the left uh, was applied with distilled water, no salts in the water. The pot in the middle was applied with hard water or high calcium and magnesium in the water. And the pot on the right was applied with a black, brackish water or high sodium content water. So you've got high sodium, high calcium, magnesium in water, um, and you apply your glyphosate, you can expect poor results. So what do we do about the problem? Um, it's actually quite simple in, in the use of good adjuvants um, that we can use for this. Same story as last time, droplet hits the leaf surface, spreads out, You've got calcium in that water, or it's a hard water. You've got glyphosate in the water. But now you have an adjuvant that contains ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate adjuvants are the adjuvants that we use with glyphosate to overcome water quality. Now, why do ammonium sulfate adjuvants work? Quite simply, this happens. The calcium, or the magnesium, or the sodium, or the potassium binds first to the sulfate, or the ammonium sulfate, before it can bind to the glyphosate. And therefore, you get good glyphosate absorption. It's as simple as that. It's important that uh, you understand here that the ammonium sulfate that I'm talking about is not fertilizer grade ammonium sulfate. It is ammonium sulfate that is uh, good enough uh, to be called spray grade ammonium sulfate. Um, and that's basically one of the most well-known adjuvants in the world and probably one of the most effective adjuvants in the world. There I've got another example of three pots again. Pot on the left, untreated. <coughs> Nothing was sprayed on that. Pot in the middle was glyphosate. And pot on the right was glyphosate plus ammonium sulfate. Now this is a very interesting slide um, because, sorry, because that shows you what type of um, uh, uh, difference in control you get just by adding ammonia, a good ammonium sulfate adjuvant to your glyphosate applications. What we have also found recently is that with the new um, formulations of glyphosate, um, um, potassium salt formulations, for instance, but also other formulations of glyphosate, even in very good quality water, we get improvements with ammonium sulfate adjuvants. So therefore, we uh, recommend good quality ammonium sulfate uh, adjuvants with any glyphosate application. This is an interesting one. This is clethodim, uh, trade name select series, those type of adjuvants. There are a few other trade names, maybe. Um, and the, what we wanted to do actually show you was the effect of um, um, ammonium sulfate with clethodim. Clethodim, in this case, to control uh, Roundup Ready maize prior to uh, planting. So we wanted to see what the effect was on clethodim on the control of Roundup Ready maize. That first arrow, you don't have to worry about any of the other pots, but the ones with the arrows, just concentrate on that one and that one. The one on the left, clethodim alone, uh, at a pretty low uh, rate of clethodim, but that was, a, that was clethodim alone. The one on the right, Clethodim plus ammonium sulfate. That was the effect of ammonium sulfate on clethodim uh, control. And we, for instance, with our product, we've registered with, with ammonium sulfate huge differences in control just by adding a good ammonium sulfate uh, to that application. The reason for that is very simply, very much the same as with glyphosate. Clethodim is influenced by, by water quality, and by using ammonium sulfate, you can improve the efficacy of clethodim um, by removing that water quality factor. There we go. 
Good. I've spoken about um, in, uh, insecticides. Um, when insecticides are broken down in high pH water, we call that alkaline hydrolysis. What alkaline hydrolysis means, alkaline means high pH. Hydrolysis means breakdown or degradation. So we know that insecticides or certain insecticides, especially those ones that are registered with buffers, are broken down in high pH water. And I explained the whole process to you just now. But here's an interesting one uh, where low pH is not good for certain products. We've spoken about where high pH is a problem for, cert for certain products, like insecticides, for instance. But we also have situations where a low pH is bad. And this is just a simple photo of a sulfonylurea, like uh, chlorimiron, uh, elegance, classic, those type of products. Uh, the bottle on the left. Um, pH 7, bottle on the right, pH 4. The same rate of uh, sulfonyl urea or chlorimiron or whatever in those two bottles, exactly the same rate. The only difference was the pH of the waters was different. So that means if you decrease the pH too much with a product like chlorimiron, uh, you get uh, an insoluble product, which is the one on the right. Now, what is the problem with that? And I'm going to get a little bit technical here, but just bear with me for a, a few seconds. Um, that just depicts the solubility of chlorimiron or classic or elegance, whatever trade name uh, you are using. You might be using another one at three different pHs, a pH of 5, a pH of 6.5, and a pH of 7. So there's not a big difference between a pH of 5 and a pH of 7. Now look at the solubility at a pH of 5. It's... 0.01 grams per liter goes up at a pH of 7 to 1.2 grams per liter. What does that actually mean? That if the pH is at 7, it's 100 times more soluble. Remember that tenfold thing that I said to you? Uh, every pH point is a tenfold. In this case, it's a tenfold increase in solubility of chlorimiron if it is applied at a pH of 7 instead of at a pH of 5. And the reason for that, uh, uh, and what happens is that basically at low pHs, uh, the product is insoluble and the control is less than at high pH values. So I've given you now examples of where a high pH is bad for insecticides, for instance, or even for products like glyphosate, for instance. But you can have the, the flip side of the coin where a low pH is bad for this product. This is just an interesting slide that we took. It's electron microscope uh, slides of droplets that are lying on a leaf surface. That's, it's a 500 times enlargement of a product similar to chlorimiron. Uh, about two hours after application, you can see there the droplet is lying on the, or the leaf surface uh, being absorbed into that leaf. But you can see that um, uh, the particle size is so huge um, that I don't think that a lot of that product will be absorbed into the leaf. It's just lying there and probably will be blown off or washed off uh, before it can be absorbed. That was at a pH of 5. Now what happens, exactly the same scenario, applied two hours after application, we took the photo of a similar um, application. That was at a pH of 7. There's the uh, droplet. There's no particles lying there. So either two hours after application, everything's been absorbed, or the particle size is so small you can't even see it, and you get good um, absorption of that product. So just keep in mind what product you're using and when you must use buffers, when you mustn't, when you must use your ammonium sulfate products, when you mustn't because it can have a huge influence on uh, pest control. I'm going to show you some data of a product that you do not use uh, in soyas, but unfortunately that's the only example of research that we did at that stage. Uh, it's Grand Star. Uh, which is uh, a similar type of product, also a sulfonyl urea uh, product, and which reacts much the same as what uh, chlorimiron might do. Um, there's the pH scale at the bottom, and on the left is the percentage control. So we look at pH 3 in that specific trial. 
all those um, treatments were applied with the same rate of grand star, the same rate of sulfonyl urea. At a pH of 3, we had about 35% control. At a pH of 5, about 65% control. At a pH of 7, about 90% control. And then we, when we increased the pH a little bit more, it went down a bit. Uh, so with this particular product, or with sulfonyl urea products in general, uh, you would rather like more of a higher pH. Now we often get the question, but what happens when I mix a sulfonyl urea with another product that requires a low pH? And I don't really have an answer to that question, but the only answer that I do have to that question is please don't then also go and use buffers in that, product, in that spray mixture. Because if you use buffers in that spray mixer, you're going to further reduce the pH and you're going to decrease your activity even further with that product. Good, I've just got one very last slide that I want to show you. It's on glyphosate. And what happens when you use the incorrect adjuvant for a specific purpose? Um, and this is a question that we get very, very often. Uh, the ammonium sulfate products that are used with glyphosate are very high rate products. So you use of a, a liquid product, you're using one to two liters per hundred liters of water. So you need a lot of product and, and a lot of uh, 20 liter drums, etc. The guys say, can't I substitute my ammonium sulfate product with a buffer? And uh, we, we get that very often, because if I use the buffer, it also brings down the pH of the glyphosate, and doesn't it also bind the salts? Now, it depends what buffer you're using, but most of the buffers that we use in South Africa, the buffers, the facetas, um, are not uh, for use with glyphosate. And, and the reason for that is just a simple photograph here. Um, we're going to go through it from left to right. On the left is the untreated control. And after that, all the pots were applied with exactly the same rate of glyphosate. So the second pot there was applied with hard water. So it was glyphosate applied with a hard water, uh, calcium and magnesium in that water antagonized the glyphosate, poor absorption, poor control. The next two pots were the lowest and the highest recommendation of Velocity Dry Max, which is basically a good quality ammonium sulfate product. You can see good control. The ammonium sulfate did its job. The next two pots in that red circle were a normal run-of-the-mill buffer product that we use in South Africa. You can see it, they did nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, if you want to use buffers with glyphosate, that's fine. Just make sure then um, that you also are using your ammonium sulfate product uh, because there's nothing like ammonium sulfate to basically bind the salts uh, in water. Um, that's just an example of, of where you would use the wrong adjuvant to rectify water quality problems. So just in short, um, when you're applying glyphosate, I would recommend using a good ammonium sulfate product um, or whatever product you're using, make sure that it will overcome all those salts in water. Don't think that you've just got low numbers of uh, salts in the water that adjuvants will not work. Remember that high pH has an influence on especially the insecticides, but also other products. But low pH, on the other hand, can also have a detrimental effect on certain herbicides. So it's important to know what product you're applying and what it's sensitive to. And I can guarantee you if you use the correct adjuvant for a specific function, you're going to get very, very good results. And that's my story. Thank you very much.